never come here to speak that had a client that asked him to put a clause in the contract that said he would have no eye contact with his client during the course of the project. He's also the only person I know who ever came here to speak who had a client that put a clause, that tried to put a clause in his contract that said at the end of every client meeting he would enter, he would leave the room uh, backwards. And once again, the Dr. Hackney uh, refused to accept those conditions. Uh, he's also the only person I know who was ever lectured in this room that had a Land Rover four-wheel drive vehicle and decided he would like a six-wheel drive vehicle, so he cut it in half, put a third axle in, made himself his own six-wheel drive vehicle. You get in the picture here? Um, he's the only one I know who uh, he arrived here on Saturday. Welcome, Joe. Have a seat. Good to see you. Joe Lund. He always comes in a couple of seconds late, but he's very conscientious. Is he in the right room, right. Mother? He's the, only, he's the only one I know who the day before arriving in Muncie spent the day in Manchester, England with Prince Charles at a project saying to him, I don't know what he calls him, but he said, you shouldn't walk around with your hand in your jacket too much like this or like this. It looks too pompous. You should put your arm around people, don't like it, and you'll have fun. That's what he told him. He's the only one I know who's done that this week. Is anybody else? Um, those are the important things. Just in passing, I think it's important for all of you to know that Rod Hackney is the only one I know who's had the um, courage and the insight to be able to deal with the architectural establishment in England, uh, to turn architecture around from an architecture where people practice with no regard for their client because at the time, the way we were trained, you always do more than a client, so you didn't even have to bother to talk to the client. So an architecture for the people, with the people. And that's what um, made Prince Charles pick him out at the 150th anniversary of the Royal Institute of British Architects several years ago, and say, this is one of the great architects of Britain, comparing him with some of the great architects in British history. Those are some of the things that he's been able to do against all odds, and I think uh, those are rather remarkable. He's written a book called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, uh, summarizing his experience doing community architecture, talking about his education. And this book was written a few years ago. Uh, there was a, a, a musical on, uh, opened up in London called Good Golly, Miss Molly, about the works of Rod Hackney. He's um, really had a tremendous experience all over the world. He has um, visited 103 countries. Uh, I've had the pleasure of traveling with him through a few of those countries in South America and the former Soviet Union. Um, this is his first trip to Muncie, and he will speak tonight on community architecture. Uh, an old friend and a really wonderful person. It's a real pleasure to have Rod Hackney with us to open our lecture series this evening. Ooh. What was the name of the first team? Charles. Charles Sappington. Thank you, Marvin. He promised not to read my CV out. And you did a very naughty thing, Marvin, making uh, my CV so obvious to the people in uh, the university here. If I'd known you were going to pin it up on the notice board, I'd have sent you the fuller version. And you cover, could have covered the whole notice board. Notice board. First, Charles... Uh, we, we had a very nice uh, dinner at Dean's house tonight, and uh, I have a special pair of spectacles. And Charles, who was your first dean, recognized the manufacturer, no, he recognized the designer as Dizzing and Weitling, which is the office in Copenhagen that I worked for when it was called Arne Jakobsen. So with your permission, Charles, I'd like you to give, uh, in commemoration of this lecture, and I hope I live up to it, if nothing else, if the lecture fails, you'll have the book that I wrote, and you can say, well, thank God we got rid of him. At least we can now read about him. So if I can give you this book, Charles. Thank you. It's only available on the black market. And now there are two books that are unavailable in Britain. This one and the one written about the royals by Kitty. These are the two books you cannot buy in England. So don't go back with it, Charles, and try and sell it. You'll get arrested. Thank <laughs> you. 
I hope I don't disappoint the purists in this room when I show you the first set of slides, which is about how I now make money to practice community architecture. Ever since that wonderful woman called Margaret, Margaret Thatcher throttled the United Kingdom into submission and got rid of communities and didn't believe in society, it is now no longer possible to get state support for community architecture. So the wonderful movements of the 70s have collapsed. And now, if you want to practice it, as I still do, it is very important to obtain clients who will hire you for the same sort of skills you need to practice community architecture, that is getting things done, but they're rich. And we have a portfolio of clients that are very, very rich. And why they employ us, God only knows, but we seem to be able to get things done for them that they couldn't normally get through the normal process. So the first set of slides, if you're coming in to see wonderful groups of people working together as a team, disappointed you might be, this is my typical English client who can clear $3 million a day clear of tax and has to spend it on something. He bought a house in the United Kingdom, which is, he has a number of houses as these people do, and we began doing little things for him in the gardens. You know, every person of this stature requires uh, landscape gardens, uh, 10,000 acres of the cap capability brown type of uh, dwelling. Uh, our first job was to put something on the uh, northern end of the property uh, using craftspeople that we had trained in the original community architecture schemes. So the people working on this scheme, a lot of them, had in fact learned their skills under our directorship. These are unemployed people that formerly would be unemployed and not have any real role in society, are now turning out to be wonderful craftspeople, people who now have pride in themselves, retrained of course, many of them were miners and pottery workers who now have found that they can do uh, those things that they need to do to keep their families going, that is make things on a building site. The details are of the highest qu possible quality and of course budget is no problem. The sort of client here doesn't talk about money except when you submit your bill, the architect's bill, then he has a haggle with you, but normally they do not talk about cash it's not the done thing to do. So all the things here are privately made by people who have learned new skills in ironmongery, carpentry, stone masonry, stained glass work, and the like. Now, having done that, it is a tradition in lots of Europe, particularly the United Kingdom, to always build something that you'll remem be remembered for when you depart this earth. So you have to have a tall structure, a folly in your grounds to show off your, uh, your wealth. And we went on a tour throughout many parts of the world looking at a, a tower that would be appropriate for the statue of this man. And I won't be naming him because it's a condition of contract I did sign that we do not name our clients because they might be embarrassed by the way I tell the story. So having identified a few towers throughout the world that he particularly liked, we found that in Moscow, the use of titanium on a huge scale, you, we, we know that uh, Gary used it a lot on the Bilbao Guggenheim, but the use of titanium in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union countries now is, is growing. So we decided in our visits that titanium would be the product to clad this building in. And the main influence I was trying to lean the client towards was of the Gaudi S school, I thought, they're making a huge mess of the Barcelona Cathedral now, the Sagrada Familia, with this continuation of the Gaudi design, but in precast concrete rather than stone. I shocked the local architects during the UIA Congress last year by saying it is a sacrilege to try and imitate a brilliant designer like Gaudi with a modern product, a product the building inspector would accept. And why not forget trying to complete a scheme why not instead build some fabric of a nave in a very high-tech style and leave the front as it was. The Moscow Cathedral, as you know, built in a record 11 and a half months, one of the largest cathedrals in the world, on the site of a former swimming pool. The more idiosyncratic I was told, the better. This is the fourth Earl of Dunmore. He built the tallest pineapple in the world to one of his girlfriends. And for a moment, this particular client said, Rod, one of these will do. Why do we need to uh, 
design something new. Wouldn't, can't we buy this one and put it in my grounds? And I said, no, that would be a bit disappointing because I won't earn any fees on this. I, you know, we must design a new building. And then we started to go down the Gothic line. This was disappointing for me because everything in Gothic's been done. You got it in the States and Europe, of course. But you rather like the Ulm Cathedral in southern Germany. It's pinnacle towards Protestantism in a sea of Catholicism. The tallest spire built in masonry in the world at 584 feet. And, of course, the monuments you see in Scotland to Scott and Wallace. We found a wonderful church in Preston. Here it is which uh, looked good enough to buy and transplant into the garden. And again, I resisted this, thank goodness. Uh, lots of churches are available. They're all being sold to Japanese golf clubs as pubs and these things these days. So I set up this portfolio of towers to replicate at the sort of varying height. The chances of buying Big Ben were slim. It was still needed in the Houses of Parliament. But in there is the tile I was to design for him. And I'll tell you the story. This is the property. These are the first sketches, rather boring at the end of the house. Another Gothic sort of structure, very much like uh, Font Hill by uh, William Wyatt for the mad uh, Duke of Beckford, whose downfall was to fall in love with a 12-year-old boy and it was put in the Punch magazine. It destroyed his career. But he told Beckford... Why I told Beckford, I can't work for you as an architect anymore. It will ruin my reputation. But he needed the fees, and he was dragged down from London every year to design Font Hill, and eventually it was built. It was going to be 50 feet high. It became, as you know, 400 feet high, and it collapsed. So this is the beginning of the design, the special rooms underneath, which are secret, although it's partially going to be used for uh, people from the public to view this wonderful art collection. This is wonderful collection underneath. And the first sketches were begun, some hand, some computer. We started to model it on paintings that were in his possession. Is this slide around or is it given up? I'll go on to the next one. And then eventually the, get, the sketches started to come through. Very difficult to work with, as you know. Titanium is a nice, strong product. Better than stainless steel. But it's not been used on many buildings yet. So we had to allow these huge, flexible joints for it. Special wind tunnel models were made. And in the end, we had something that seemed to be satisfactory to all except the planners. It is a listed building, a building of historic merit, sitting in a special scientific area, within a conservation area, within a national park. <laughs> but he, he said to me, Rod, you'll get it built for me, won't you? As you can see, it will be equal to any of these, probably better than anything before. <laughs> and at $310 million, you can see at 10%, this is a nice little learner. <laughs> and pays for what it's all about. I hope he doesn't see that you're videoing this. Don't please send it in because he'll stop the commission. And that'll be a pity because he'll stop the community architecture projects I'm involved in. It is a condition of contract. Anybody working for me, they live in the project. I get lots of people after a lecture saying, Rod, can we come and work for you? Please don't try and do that because a lot of you have got good families and you're too nice to do this sort of work. This is the revolution. This is missionary zeal. This is really putting your reputation on the line, taking a risk for five or six years. And to be honest with you, it's not worth doing. Really. The obstacles are so great. There are quicker ways of earning a crust. And for those that still believe in the revolution, and there are still few around, it doesn't start here. It requires commitment and care to detail of understanding human beings. A lot of people don't like putting their reputation on the line. You can't get insurance, it doesn't exist, and yet people still do it. By living on a site, you understand the people, whether it's old or new, new being 1960s, I mean. And to try and understand what we're trying to do, there are something like 1.5 billion people in the world living in insecure tenure patterns. Many of them not even on the land, they're in the sea. They're getting by. I, I used to work in uh, Libya, and as you know, in Libya and China, they have underground houses. I worked in Tripoli for King Idris, and then Colonel Gaddafi when Idris was 
deposed by the revolution and my job was to try and settle squatters in Tripoli and Benghazi. But when you look at the desert houses and the wonderful climate control and compare them with some of the shanty towns of Alexandria in South Africa, all the developments in uh, Bogota, Sao Paulo, or northern Shenzhen before it really got to grips with itself and start to see how these work then you start to understand in the first world how we can learn from the third world successes. Now these aren't great architecture in the traditional sense but they do possess some certain values that we need to understand which is why people work together as a team. Well it's basically to survive, the need to survive therefore you forget your bickering, you forget treading on each other's toes you realize that you must avoid destroying this close-knit grouping. You're all poor together, and the architect has to be in amongst that, as poor as this to do it, and not artificially poor. To look at the southern European hill towns is another example. Here, over many years, many centuries, you've had continuity of building form, built on the hills, not to ruin the agricultural land, not always for defense. It's rather strange that in much of Europe and North America, you seem to build your structures and cities on the best agricultural land. Very, very strange and silly when you think how sophisticated it was supposed to be. And then another example of, in the most complicated society in Mexico, that after the earthquake, people began to participate in the process of being you know, real players in the process of rehousing. They lived on the streets. The divided highways were made into single uh, lanes in one division of the highway, and the other half of the highway was given over to tented villages, and the people began to be involved in the design of the new houses that replaced the damaged houses. Another example is the success of the squatter settlements in Brasilia, where the wonderful second-generation modern movement architecture has given way to more people living in the shanty towns than live in the sort of second generation modern movement tower blocks. We might, we might as well miss that and go on to the next one. I'm coming now to where my schemes begin. They're mainly in the big high rise systems and they're mainly in the Victorian slums of Britain. We have four million houses unfit for human habitation many of which would normally be demolished by the system and new buildings put up by the system, that is the uh, state. The state can no longer afford to do this. It bankrupted itself with poor houses built in the 60s and the private sector will not do it because there's simply no profit for them to do it. So by learning from the third world, who are better at doing this than the first world, by going back to the pre-Thatcher way of thinking that you must if you're poor, unite with your neighbours to succeed. This often frightens many people in government and bureaucracies. They see this as a start of maybe an alternative movement against the state. It isn't, of course. If this slide on this side, please, can just catch up with that, that would be nice. Trying to persuade people in power, and many of the cities have no money, thank you, that's dead right, but they do have the power of saying no. And the worst thing in the world, of course, is a bureaucrat emasculated of power who still stays in position, exercising the only thing left to him, and that is to say no. Those people need to be re-educated back into a useful role. And the community architect's job is to do that. That is, you represent your client to these people by saying, look, instead of administering to the poor and keeping them poor, uh, why not help them break out of their shackles and become prosperous? and do a good thing for once in your life. So that's part of the process. And you cannot do that by walking out of a studio into a town hall meeting. You've got to do it by coming out of these houses with your army of endeavor behind you, supporting you in what you're doing. A diverse culture, of course, we have in Britain now, being formerly a big empire of the world. Uh, many people coming in from the old and new parts of the Commonwealth. And many of these people have the skills that you need far better than the whites who are the indigenous population mainly in Britain. And they come with skills that they've learned uh, to survive in their villages, particularly from the Indian subcontinent. Wonderful 
tribute. And you heard Marv mention good colleague Miss Molly. It was about Stoke-on-Trent on the right there, after it was improved. The products of the 60s never worked. They would never work. They had no chance of working because when you try and build in a quick way, you forget the main ingredient was to ask the consumer whether they would like the product. So it doesn't work, basically. And every Sunday now, the main sport in Britain isn't soccer. It's demolishing tower blocks. And it's a shame. It is a shame to see these being demolished when you think of the lives that have already been shattered for the people already living in them. These have only been up 10 to 15 years, and yet they're now coming down. And you can imagine what that does to the sort of spirit and way with all of ordinary people. And it isn't like the Roman and Greek remains that look rather attractive on the ground. These are people's lives shattered. And how do we ask people? It is strange in a European context of consumerism. You normally ask the buyer what they would want to buy if they had the money not to have done it with housing. And yet we made this huge mistake of doing it without their participation. Had we asked these people, would you like these tower blocks, they would have said no. If you then said to them, well, the only way we can rehouse you with the density we need is to go high, that argument will be equally destroyed because we now realize by going high, you couldn't have them very close together. You didn't really gain much in the density increase by going high. And then if you could explain to them that occasionally the elevator wouldn't work, that would be a total disaster. And people wouldn't bother to use it. They wouldn't bother to approve the scheme. Those blocks you saw there were in Hackney. It's an interesting place, part of uh, London. And one of the blocks they were demolishing was 22 stories high. And most of them are done with beautiful atomic clocks. That is, you have a little device on each floor within a microsecond of the one above where it all implodes. In the old days, you used to have to clear people out for a huge distance, something like uh, 500 meters. Uh, but now, you can almost be living very, very close to these. And they've got the technology so perfect, they just drop them almost next to the block next door. And uh, Mary Rand, who was 87, was in one of these properties. And you know what happens with elderly people? They tend to wheedle through the system. You don't see them. And uh, Mary and Edna, Edna Sharples, were living next door, and they decided to have coffee together on their balcony. And nobody told them that the elevator uh, wasn't working that day. Thank you. And uh, Edna had gone down for some tea bags from the local greengrocer come general store and had got the tea bags and eventually made her way up the stairs uh, to the floor that uh, Mary was on and they were having a cup of tea in the balcony. The whole block had been totally evacuated, the people, and the signal had been given that we were ready to demolish this block. There was nobody in there. And the block was blown up with Edna and Mary on their balcony on whatever floor they were. And instead of it falling down to the ground floor, as most had done, like that one you saw earlier there. The, all the explosives from the 11th floor down failed. So the 22-story block became 11 stories. And uh, Edna said to Mary, did you feel that? And Mary said, yes. You know what happened? I think they've got the elevators working again. <laughs> but how sad to see the nice wallpaper. And if you're an official of a town hall or an architect, or a builder, and you say, look, we tried our best. You, the tenants, didn't appreciate what we did. You let it go this way. They know that's not true. It's simply not true. So the first lesson, thank you for that, is to ask the question, would you live in this if we did it? And the answer would be no. I came back from probably one of the best experiences in the world, working for the master, Arnie Jakobsen, in Copenhagen. And he gave me, just before he died, in March 1971, his whole library of information to do a PhD at Manchester University. And I had to find a very cheap house, which I did in Black Road, there it is on the left, fourth one along, which was only a thousand pounds, $1,700. 
of which only £300 was the fabric, £700, $1,200 was the fridge and the bits and pieces, bed and furniture. We had one toilet for six houses and one wash house for ten, all shared. Very nice and primitive outside, very nasty in winter when it's cold. People generally got on. They did borrow sugar from each other, but they did, of course. There were lots of fights. And they came around to see me and said, Rod, we can't allow you to just carry on with this silly university course. When we are living in these Dickensian conditions, you're going to have to help us. And I decided to stop the work. We knocked down a few toilets, which was meant as a sort of defiant act to the local authority who was saying we were irresponsible in trying to oppose the demolition of these properties. But by knocking down the toilets, we definitely became uh, in a predicament. And that meant we had to get some attention. We did it for publicity, of course. My job was to show people that you can work within the system. The system just has to re-educate itself. And rather than destroy somebody's, per somebody's job in the uh, city administration, why not make it? Show them that they can survive in their position without losing their salary. And my job was to take them on this journey from this to this with them doing it themselves. You can imagine 50% of the people were elderly over 65 and 70 to 80% were unemployed. No work at all. No official paid work, I should say. <clears throat> it was during Mr. Heath's three-day week where the lights went out for four days a week. And my job was to teach the skills. <clears throat> now, if you're going to do this, you must mean it, I must say, because you're going to be taken to court at no end, which improves your reputation. <clears throat> In the very foreground here, you've got Chris, whose dad loved working on his own house, and he's with his sister and his big brother. And my job was to teach not only the youngsters, the fathers rather, and mothers, the skills of carpentry and lumber work and joinery, and all the other trades, plastering and digging trenches, and trying to tell people these days you have to go deep, you know, three foot for a foundation. Whereas in the old days, in 1815, when these were built, you didn't have to do that. My job was to also teach the youngsters that they, rather than destroy their houses, a lot of vandalism, I must tell you, by being involved with the construction, then they will actually realize how hard it is to make a house. They can feel materials. But I got taken to court for using child labor on a site. It was very difficult arguing with a slide like this that these people are over 18. They're not, as you can see. <laughs> so it was up before the beak. Rod Hackney, they've got him this time sort of thing. He's definitely employing child labor. And of course I was. The father was really employing, but I was encouraging them. I was enticing people to break the safety executive laws, which were now you know, so tight that uh, you couldn't even wire up your own socket to plug in for the electric kettle. And I was teaching them that you don't need professionals to do this. I was actually saying, you're the most professional in the world, you know it all, you've lived here. You can't afford to employ, use the labor costs of a laborer. You must do it yourself. Let's buy some cheap materials and do it. The only way out of that was for the father and mother to say, there's nothing wrong with Rod. He might have broken the technical part of the law. And for Chris to come in crying into the court and say, they're not going to take Rod away, are they, please? You can imagine the judge. You're not, judges are very good, I must tell you. Prosecutors are bad, normally. Right? They're just carrying out their job, and they don't have that skill of actually gauging whether they should do what they're doing. My job, I must do my job. Hitler got very on very well with the system, as you know. I'm just doing my job. I'm obeying the orders. Most people now... It's more than their job is worth to reinterpret the rules fairly so you create a decent society. But judges are of that school. So you just live through this and hope for the best and hope the judge has not a bad night. And when the parents say he's done nothing wrong, leave him alone. And, this, and then Chris says, holding your hand in the dock, you leave him, emo you leave him alone, you nasty man. Right? The judge will say, just a minute, I haven't passed judgment on this. Uh, I've read the law. Rod Hackney would be technically guilty, but if you look carefully in the law, it says usually. It says usually. Usually this would apply. I think this is an unusual circumstance. 
these people would not normally have their own house, they wouldn't build it, and therefore I find him not guilty. And God has made a hero. And that's the time, by the way, to put your fee account into these people, because by now, they're earning a bit of money, right? And you must eventually get paid, even though you've led it with your own sweat equity. Eventually, these people, although they don't pay you at the beginning, will pay you in the end. And the same applies. We can have four or five court cases per scheme. And teaching people plastering is the most difficult skill of all. Most men like bricklaying, like to build a shelter for their family, <clears throat> hunter-gatherer sort of approach. Get them building a yard wall first, make a mess of that, and then go on to the main house after. And you can imagine 100 people in 30 houses doing this over a year. And in the end, you get a nice scheme. You could use the old bricks from the toilets. You make some nice spaces where there were no spaces before. And people actually make friends again with themselves, with their families. The dads who are really out, out of it, I'll tell you, there's nothing worse than an unemployed man who can no longer bring in any income to the family. Doesn't always lead to divorce, but these people will go out at nine in the morning and come back at five as if they'd gone to work. It is the saddest sight in the world to see an unemployed man trying to keep his dignity when his job in life of bringing in money doesn't work. So you must reinstate that man's stature and self-esteem. If you get that right, then the children will work, learn to re-inspect, re respect their dad, and it goes from there. So the architect is part of this social re-establishment of values, absolutely essential. The community meetings are important <clears throat> because you start to get rid of the political leaders. Every scheme has these leaders who tend to stand out as very important, but when you test them with a bit of hard work, they disappear, and the real leaders come through. Most of our leaders are women. They can see the main chance of what they're trying to do. Uh, but we do begin with the political men who are saying, you know, we're going to show the town hall, we're not going to allow this. That's easy and cheap to say. You hear politicians say it every day. They don't mean it, they can't do it anyway. But they say it. What you want is the real people that mean it, and they take a long time to come off their seats and say, I can help here. Two years sometimes. And that's why the architect living and working in the scheme finds this out. Leicester was a nice scheme, mainly people from Bangladesh. 70% of the people from Dakar, the capital of Bangladesh, uh, Muslim, they had no need to borrow any money for this scheme. It all came from, you can imagine money coming from Bangladesh to Britain to do this scheme, or from their hard-earned income. Many of them in the black economy, I must say, many of them were illegal immigrants, but they did survive, and they knew how to survive, and then having done all their houses up, they then started to build new houses, with my sort of designs, of course, and then took over the streets from the highway engineer. They actually take control of their area. They make new inroads into where you would never think they would go, doing the streets and closing them off and things like that. Stirling, Scotland, perhaps the most successful scheme ever in Scotland. Every person in the town, in this part of town, was actually unemployed. Miners had been working in one mine that was closed, another mine was closed, all four mines were closed. And our job was to persuade them that their skill, you can imagine the camaraderie of men working underground. That was a huge resource for Genevieve Jones, who did this for me, and her team of five architects. And we decided to tap that particular resource. A bit of new build, of course, and a bit of rehab. We had to get the money for this. This wasn't easy. You can imagine going to the lending societies and banks, getting the money. But this is where the skill of the architect comes in. Jenny lived in the scheme. She reported me on a, to, to, on a daily basis to me in my Macclesfield office. She went first to the Scottish Building Society to see if she can get mortgages. And they said, well, not really, because your clients are all unemployed. There's no guarantee they can pay back, so no. She then went to Edinburgh to the... Uh, Abbey National main office, because the Stirling office of the Abbey National didn't work uh, in the, her line of thinking. It was a no-no anyway, whereas the uh, Edinburgh office was a big one. And they promised to look at the scheme and review it, which was no good either because it was taking time. She went back to the uh, Scottish Building Society in Stirling and said, 
I have to tell you, you're not the only people in the market. I've been to Edinburgh, and I must tell you, we are having a dialogue, and we've been invited back. By this time, the Scottish building society had offered two mortgages over their dead body, they said, but two, body, two, two mortgages for you, which allowed Jenny to go back to Edinburgh and say, we've been, off, we've been offered mortgages from the uh, Scottish building society. We can't tell you how many, but shame on you. A big society like the Abbey National can't lend money. The Abbey National said then, after a special board meeting, we're offered 10 mortgages which allowed Jenny to go back to the Scottish and say, we've had mortgages offered to us in double figures from the uh, Scottish. <laughs> and eventually, after a year, you get the money, right? You get the money. And you know not one of these miners, unemployed miners, ever repaid, ever defaulted on the repayment. And it was sorted. It was sorted. Very important that Jenny got the men working, you know, in the ground first, come out of the ground with the drains. <clears throat> The foundations were 12 inches thick because nobody wants to keep to plans. We had to persuade the planners and the building inspector to approve them without knowing exactly what we're going to do. We said it's going to be a certain height and a certain width, but by having 12 inch solid slabs reinforced at the edges, the walls could go anywhere. We had expansion joints where houses were. The first ever self-build I did, by the way, made huge mistakes. I actually strung out on the grass each person's plot and people didn't believe how small it looked when you peg it out with string. And in the middle of the night, and this was in a scheme in Langley near Macclesfield, four people moved the pegs overnight. So instead of being four meters wide, everybody four meters wide, some were only two meters wide, and some were six meters wide. And everybody that moved the pegs swore they'd never done it. And so from then on, we now arranged the slabs to be poured communally with expansion joints at every four meters or five meters, depending on width it is. And of course, on the front and back, you can't go beyond the structure if you want the building to stand up. So that's, you wouldn't learn that, would you, unless you made that mistake. So it's full of making mistakes. Never be afraid of making mistakes. Chesterfield, a wonderful place where now we're getting very confident now. We are into uh, encouraging people in the community to buy the old industrial mills up and convert them. And everything you see here is designed by the local residents with the architects in charge of the design on site. Paul Joza here and his team of six architects did this for me in uh, Chesterfield. He originally did some work for me in Leicester, move up to Chesterfield. <clears throat> that was the theory that if you involve people in it, it'll work, it'll have some sustainability, and it does work. And the quality is much higher, of course. When people do it themselves, the quality is higher. And this became very successful. <clears throat> so successful, we had presidents and kings, princes, coming along and saying, it's a good job you're doing, Rod. This man came along and said, uh, what we're doing, we should do more of. The problem is you can't do more of it. You can't expand it in scale by making it easier to do. You've got to have the struggle to do it. You must be poor to do it. Otherwise, why are you doing it? People will only do it if they have to, if they're living in a poor area that's threatened by an external force, they will do it. If there's no threat, they will not do it. So you have to have those ingredients which can't be artificially created. And he came into my life in 1984. Marv knows this story. I'm the Vice President of the Royal Institute of British Architects. And he makes a speech to the 3,000 gathered throng of very self-important architects waiting to hear their future king credit them on 150 glorious years of architecture. But he didn't do that. He said uh, 150 wasted years when you could have done far better. This is not a very nice guest to have, is it really? And he finished his speech by saying there are only two architects I would give any time to, Rod Hackney and Ted Cullinan. Nobody knew me. But I must tell you, I've never lost so many friends in one night and made so many enemies. I had been drinking uh, a nice glass of wine with, surrounded by people who rather tight at Hampton Court uh, in the actual sculpture court there, Hampton Court. And by the time he finished his speech, people had drifted away as if I had leprosy. There was a huge area of grass between me and anybody else. And nobody would look at me in the eye 
we didn't get to see many people directly, although they were all around, even at the dinner table later. Charles Greer said very politely at the end of the speech, sir, we have much to talk about over dinner, which vented people's frustrations. They started to applaud that. You can imagine muted applause for a king, a future king was out uh, clapped by uh, the applause for Charles Greer, who let the lid off the vacuum of this. They were worrying, of course. And at the end of the dinner, he asked to see me, and I went to see him, and he said he's coming up to Macclesfield, and I've never, ever had a peaceful life ever since. My phones are tapped, my conversations with him, by the way, if you ever call me, you'll be on the British Secret Service tape, so be careful what you say. The newspapers bug, and uh, very interesting, in 1986, <clears throat> I was having a private chat with him in Australia, and... Uh, it appeared, the whole conversation appeared on the front of the New Sun newspaper the following morning. When I spoke to the editor and denied it, he said, great, Rod, we'll run the denial in the morning and even get more circulation figures out from that. So be careful if you befriend uh, people of this character. <clears throat> but he was part of the process. He was thinking that community architecture was useful. <clears throat> and he's now set up his own school of architecture. Here it is in London which is very expensive, but very, very prestigious. Ironically, the Royal Institute of British Architects is not satisfied with the standard yet and has refused accreditation. <laughs> we'll lose Royal soon. We'll be the Institute of British Architecture. But that's the sort of thing he teaches, practical things. And some little things to finish off my talk. This, this one I put in for you, Charles. This is the building I designed in Q8 for uh, Arne Jacobson, the QH Central Bank. Design, I must tell you, this is how strange the briefs are when they write them for you. My brief here was to design a building that would withstand Israeli nuclear rocket attack. <laughs> and if you look in the books, there's nothing on that. Right? <laughs> so I went to Chubb Engineering in London and said, I, you know, we, I'm in Copenhagen, can you... Can you design the building that if it's ever hit by an Israeli uh, nuclear rocket, it will be all right? They said, probably not, but we can probably get the strong room so strong that it can be blown out of the earth and land in the Persian Sea and still be intact. I said, that's probably do. Got, <laughs> got, got the client to agree. He said, are you sure the money will be okay when it's sort of been blown out of the sky? I said, the worst problem is it's going to land in the wrong country. They said, they said, no problem, all around here we have friends, right? We have Iran in the north, Saudi Arabia in the south, Iraq up there. And of course it wasn't the Israelis that bombed it, but the Iraqis that asked for the front door key. We could have saved a fortune on that building had we known that the real enemy was the Iraqis. And they emptied the strong room. They didn't need to blow it up, they just asked for the combination. And all the gold went to Baghdad. 90% of it has come back, but when I laugh at the brief given to my client by clients, right, the most ridiculous brief that you get, you know, is daft. Right? But it's a test. You go along with it, of course, if you want to be paid, but to treat it with a sense of humour. And the oddest thing of all now, this building here, I get on very well with Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers, and this was really not meant to be the way we know it now. This was on the back of an envelope submission very late, Richard and Renzo knew, them, knew each other well, both Italian, of course. And uh, they said it was a building that was supposed to land out of, the, uh, you know, out of the sky, a spaceship, in the middle of Paris. Pompidou was in charge. Uh, it was an international union of architects competition. People were so bored with the others, they chose this one. And now it is these buildings that are threatened because this has become a real gem. Structurally, has problems, of course, on the joints, but that will be resolved, that's just money. <coughs> but back to my sort of architecture. <coughs> you learn tricks of the trade when you get grants, as we did then from the central government. The grant was for rehabilitation. This is my office on the corner. <coughs> Two little nasties happened here. I wanted to knock it down because it was the cheapest way and rebuild it. They said if you did that, it would be new and you'd need a car parking space off the highway of six metres, which was silly, because it wouldn't work. And if it's new, we can't give you a grant. So we did the roof first, then we knocked the walls down, 
and did the walls, and then we took the floors out and did the floors. But even then, we were caught out because the highway engineer said, Rod, I want a sight line through the corner. So we cut, having done the roof to a point, we cut a meter off and built it, and then experimented with this wonderful display. <clears throat> we started very early. Don't forget, it's all self-built. I'm doing this. This is me. I'm laying these. And I thought we'd start about uh, two meters high, and we'll see if we can get back to the, the roof. We did. <clears throat> this detail now is an approved detail in Macclesfield <clears throat> for every corner of every new build. Look at them. There they are. The people that did this now do that. Beautiful things. Recycled stone. We had Bulgarian visitors that showed off their Bulgarian self-building Plovdiv. We had Bulgarian balconies. So if you come now to my place in Cheshire, <clears throat> you see lots of those, 5,000 of those, for the residents are built. You say what happens to builders after they, they've learned their skill, after they've uh, <clears throat> become employed again. Well, they, they get employed in the building trade. They, get, they, go, they, go, they go on to earn their keep practicing the skills they learned when they did the self-build. A little quiz for you. I know how learned you Americans are. One more, two more minutes of this lecture. In traveling abroad, I asked when I was president of the International Union of Architects for the best artists in each city in many of the countries of Europe, there are nine here, to depict through artistic form their, uh, their city. Uh, there are only nine, not twelve, because I lost three slides. For the one who gets most tonight, you get a copy of the book. Right, here it is. So write them down, please. I know what they are. And they're in alphabetical order, if it helps you. Forget these two. Little quiz. Finish off the show, as it were. First city. <coughs> Second city. Look carefully at some of these signs. Don't forget, alphabetical order gives you a clue. Third city. Fourth city. This one, although it's painted very recently, reflects the city as it used to be. Fifth one coming up, and sixth one. <clears throat> I must tell you, I did this the other day in France, and only the best they got was four. So don't feel inhibited if you don't get many. The seventh and the eighth. <clears throat> oh, we got ten. And the ninth and the tenth, they are. For those who want to come forward, if you get more than three, you're doing well, I must tell you. Free book here. So back to my work. Total accident. Right, don't anybody tell you. John Turner's next book tells you Rod went there deliberately. Rubbish. I went to do a PhD, and I now finished that. Uh, but it was an accident. We've done a lot of these now. We're famous for it. And now we're coming back to another renaissance of it, because Mrs. Thatcher basically saw it off. I think we're now going to see lots of government aid for this sort of work. When you say it's not architecture, it doesn't photograph well for the Architecture Review or the Azure de Huy or Bowen and Vonan. You're probably right. But I think architecture isn't just about what it looks like. It's about how it's made. It's a philosophy. Community architecture is a philosophy of life. And the hopeful slide is here. <clears throat> On the left, this is Belfast. This is the uh, Woodvale, uh, Ardoin area of Belfast. On the left is Catholic. And on the right is Protestant, both self-built, but look what's done in the middle. <clears throat> to satisfy the gangsters in the city, they built the wall. The only grant they got was to build the wall, which is that thick, reinforced with metal, and will take bombs. Two communities on the opposite side of the sectarian divide, knowing that one day when the wall comes down, there'll be a nice two-meter-wide path there for their kids to play together. That's what happens in community architecture. You can believe in the long term. You can believe that even the worst things happening in your society can be overcome. They weren't allowed to leave the wall out, I must tell you. They wouldn't have had any problem, but they represented a success that was flying in the face of those who are trying to sustain this sectarian violence. It isn't a religious war in Belfast. It is a war of power mongers. The residents know it. Everybody knows it. But they built the wall anyway, to, so they wouldn't get picked on by the big brothers of the Protestant or the Catholic sector. <clears throat> so I show that slide because I think it uh, shows hope. 
community architecture can bring hope where others can't. Four million people in Britain and minister to the poor. It is breaking through their barrier and persuading them that by giving people a bit of hope instead of sitting on them all the time. It took us ages to persuade people in the Dole Department to keep paying the unemployment pay to people who were learning to get out of their strife and mess. They were arguing they were beginning to learn a skill, therefore they couldn't be paid the dole. We persuaded them that wasn't the case in Watsondale in 1984. If you need to read more in the library, if it's been returned, is a copy of this book. The uh, Dean's got one, Marvin's got one, and I've got a spare one here as well, uh, which I'll leave for the library, Marvin. So you've got two instead of one. Do we have questions, Marvin, or, or what? We can take two or three, yeah. but the rest outside. Okay. Two, two questions then, please. On anything you want. Royal family, Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> <coughs> the difference between Europe and America, I don't mind that one. <coughs> How to cure a bad throat. Yes, please. No, but they'll welcome you back and show you around. You won't see a cigarette packet anywhere. Quality of life, very high. Huge sense of humor. When the uh, theorists come around, we had the whole of Doxiardis' office around Subalopolis, around Leicester, trying to fit what we did into their theory. It was very interesting to see how they were doing it. You know, they had a theory which wasn't based on any real common sense, but they found what we did worked. That was useful. We don't do artificial things like post scheme testings. Right? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you see it. Right? But most community architecture works if it's done from the ground up and it isn't treated like a statistical exercise. It's a 100% success rating that we seem to get because you can't afford to fail. You can't fail. You can imagine having lived in a scheme six years to raise their expectations and then for not to succeed. You're doing worse than the, the new build developments there. So don't start unless you finish. <clears throat> and you go for broke. You must go for broke. I was reported to the RIBA for malpractice many times, but in one time they had me. They actually reported, the local branch reported that I had not charge my clients fees when we had mandatory minimum fees, de facto. I went to see Lord Scarman who said, <clears throat> they're out to get you, Rod. Uh, you must do something about it. You can't really plead mitigation. I said to him, he was saying you should. I said, no. Um, the only way to succeed was to stand for the presidency of the RIBA and actually get hold of the file and give myself immunity. Now that came in the middle of a scheme, and I, I did that. That was the only way out of it. I had huge problems with local authorities who, after Prince Charles came, said I was working from an office that wasn't approved, which it wasn't. <coughs> the case against me was I was damaging the residential amenity of the area, which I thought was a good one, seeing we were saving it. And you know how interesting that was. When we got to the town hall, a room of this size, the local authority on that side, sitting where Charles was sitting, about four of them, and this was packed with residents. And the inspector from London, very nice man in a three-pin suit, had come for a day. He saw all these people and said, we're going to be here three weeks if these are all going to talk. Can we not do a deal? And the local authority inspector said, no, we can't do a deal because if you give Rod permission to have an office, in his street, then all the architects will want an office in the street. But again, the inspector allowed us to stay by giving his planning permission because of exceptional circumstances. <clears throat> and every resident was willing to speak. The, the, the actual edict only lasted uh, two days before he gave us permission. But to come back to the question, I'm sick to death of theorists coming along and trying to sustain a theory that can only work if you never do anything. Right? In a world where in 100%, only 99%, only 1% is real and 90% is actually writing about it. I wrote my theory when you did it. Right? 
the people I trust are people that have done it. I don't trust those who write about it or talk about it too much. <clears throat> That's not meant as a criticism of academia. It isn't. We've got to have young people. They can never do a second scheme. I don't mind the theorists coming around and giving it a bit of support for themselves and trying to make it straight jacket into their scheme, but we can't even make rules for this. It's basically being there and going with the scheme. It's an unusual experience, but if you simply go in and say, I'm here, I'm willing to help, hit me if you think it's stupid, but I'm really here and I mean it, I'm not going to go away. That's what the professional job is. You don't need post-scheme assessment studies to know if you've succeeded or failed. But it is very, very clear if you've succeeded or failed. And I, I don't know a community architecture scheme of self-build that we've done that's failed. It would be the last thing you'd ever see. Second question, please. Uh, 